Mufords. This is the topic of today's video. Not this specific water mill, but a water mill nonetheless. Alright, so one might think that this project started right here with the Chevy truck, but it was actually the other way around. First I received this huge box with the diorama, and I decided to get the truck after some brief consideration. I have never worked with a commercially available diorama before, so I was pretty stoked after seeing what's in the box. However, what actually bothered me was the overall weight of this piece. You see, just the base alone clocks in at almost 3 kilograms, and that's a lot of weight, my friends. If I add the remaining plaster castings, the weight goes up to more than 3.5 kilos, but that actually means the water mill itself isn't heavy at all. Besides, the base is quite large for my needs, so let's see what can be done with it. The first job is gluing the water mill together. So far, I've always created my buildings from a single block of styrofoam, which is very lightweight and sturdy. Here I was concerned about two things aligning the pieces perfectly so there would be very little to no filling required, and making the structure durable enough so it wouldn't accidentally snap in my hands during the painting session. My solution was once again styrofoam, but not on the outside. I basically created a few blocks that would fit inside the building, acting as an internal skeleton or reinforcement. Everything was cut on my Proxon Thermocut for maximum accuracy, but even then I had to add some extra pieces here and there. Now, granted, the hollow shell gives you the option to add an interior or make a cutout of the house from the opposite side, but that was just never my thing. So if there were windows, I just made a simple hole in the foam and painted the insides black. This way, I know I can grab the building anywhere and it won't snap in my hand. Although the individual walls line up perfectly, there's just no way to avoid a visible seam line. RT recommends using plaster to fill those gaps, but I like to use this lightweight acrylic putty from Berg's work. It's a quick, clean job and the additional scribing and detailing is a lot of fun. One of the great advantages of plaster is how easy it is to add realistic cracks with hobby blade. This actually gives me some cool ideas for my own future projects. And once I had both pieces filled and post-processed, I could glue them together. Note that I was very generous with the PVA glue at all times. I really wanted to make sure the house would stay in one piece. Now, the roof on this thing is the coolest design ever. It's built from individual laser cut timbers and assembling it feels like playing with some geeky, crafty, DIY set of Legos. Using this construction was a much easier option than cutting another block of foam and it gave me the option to leave some of the interior visible. Because it's gonna support the wooden veneer on the backside of the mill, I made sure the timbers and in fact everything else are lined up perfectly. That also includes the flat foundation pieces, also cut from wood, that go underneath the roof tiles. As soon as the wood was dry, I could laminate the backside and enclose the entire building. I used 0.6mm oak veneer, which is very discreet, has a nice texture, and it's flexible yet sturdy enough so it won't get damaged by rough handling. Because the only thing I wanted to be visible were the support beams in the attic, Everything else had to be painted black. Also, you can see here that I had to glue additional pieces on the backside to make a nice, straight foundation for the veneer. Using a single sheet will give it a very clean, professional look. So, even if someone wants to see the unimportant side of the diorama, they'll quickly realize that no corners were cut during its creation. And because the plaster is quite heavy, I just had to flip the whole thing on its side and leave it for a few hours to ensure a tight, clean bond. Every time I laminate something, I leave enough protruding material which then has to be carefully shaved off. This way I can use a fresh hobby blade to precisely trace the contours of the surface, creating a seamless transition between the building or the diorama and the veneer. A little bit of acrylic putty applied with a paintbrush will hide any differences in texture, and once everything is painted, it's gonna look really good. 
Laying down the roof is another fun experience. The tiles come in rows made from thick black paper, and you just need to line them up so they form these square-shaped slate tiles. So far I've always made roofs from individual pieces, either by using my own 3D printed shingles, or tiles made from thin pieces of styrofoam and glued them one by one. Both approaches have their benefits. This is much quicker and intuitive, but it's much easier to achieve nice variety and subtle imperfections if you glue the pieces one by one. I like how the whole system works. When one side is dry enough, you simply cut off the excess with scissors and then cut it flush with a knife. The cardboard acts more like rubber while it's still saturated with uncured PVA glue, so it's a really interesting experience. When it's completely dry, it's possible to sand it smooth and once again line it up perfectly with the invisible wall on the other side. I also used some of the leftover sprues, so to say, from the roof and made these half-pipe drainage pieces. It's very common to see some kind of solution similar to this when a roof meets a wall, because without it, there would be a ton of damage caused by moisture on the wall. The remaining wooden parts are all laser cut. Straight shapes such as planks are made from hardwood and they have a nice subtle texture. However, complex shapes such as the railings or the water wheel are cut from MDP or chipboard. And while this material is plenty stiff, it doesn't have any convincing wood grain texture and it's next to impossible to add it with your own efforts. We also get a bunch of beautiful 3D printed details and some of them, such as the door hinges, are easier to super glue in place. Others, such as the window shutters, are better to keep separate for easier painting. The water wheel was probably the most intimidating part of the build for me, but sometimes the things that terrify us the most are actually the easier ones. The only tedious part was cleaning up the countless 3D printed pieces, and when you're scraping this type of material, a lot of sticky dust and shavings are created. I found that washing them in alcohol helps to get a smooth, clean look. The rest is just about squeezing them into the laser cut wheel and checking if the alignment of the whole structure is correct. Once it is all done, super glue can be added to hold it all together. Now that I'm talking about 3D printed parts, I realized that the small window hinges are missing from the kit. It's a very small detail, quite easy to overlook in fact, but I think it adds to the overall impression. And with that, we have all the important elements of the diorama ready. Choosing an aftermarket building instead of scratch building it on your own might seem like the easier way out, but everything comes with its own specific challenges. Overall, it was a refreshing experience to put something this huge together, not to mention the more complex details like the water wheel, which I just wouldn't be able to build on my own. And while we're talking about huge things, let's address the large and heavy base. I prepared a smaller version, made from 4cm and 2cm thick sheets of styrofoam. These are gonna be important in just a moment. First, I made some rudimentary foundations from cork sheets. One goes under the water mill and a smaller one under the pier that holds the water wheel. These will help me to quickly and precisely position them at any moment, and it's also gonna be easier to apply the scenic terrain around these areas. It comes in super handy when you need things to line up perfectly, such as the middle of the pier being centered with the opening for the wheel axle in the building. I also made a few simplified bricks from this material, and these will hold the staircase in place. The next logical step is to create the small creek that powers the entire mill. To replicate it as closely as possible to the original, I took measurements from the edge of the diorama and made a mark at every turn of the creek, measuring not only its placement but also the contours. I also marked out the cobblestone road using the same method. The base was cut in half on my Proxon Thermocut, which is excellent for straight, precise cuts. However, for irregular terrain features, we can use knives or a much better option, a handheld foam cutter. 
I did the job in two steps. First, outlining the shape of the creek as closely as possible, and then creating the sloped bank by cutting at an angle. Whenever the terrain becomes more complicated, it's always a smart idea to break it down into multiple sections and work them individually. It's gonna look great when you put them all back together, and most importantly, everything is gonna be very neat. Here's the finished skeleton of the base, with the road section dry fitted for the time being, and when compared with the original piece, it's more compact and most importantly, lighter. It weighs almost nothing. Let's now get to the most satisfying part of the process, creating all the interesting terrain features. The creek is undoubtedly the most detailed part of this scenery, and it's not just because you would expect it to be reinforced with stones. The original author of the diorama was very creative and added a lot more visual candy which was just too awesome not to replicate. But let's take it one step at a time. Adding the stones in a realistic way is like assembling puzzles. You have to look for suitable pebbles and position them properly. A drop of PVA glue will hold them in place, while giving you enough time to make small adjustments. Note how the cork foundation for the mill is starting to get integrated into the scene. The transition between the terrain and the building is gonna be very smooth, and everything will click together perfectly. I had to design and 3D print my own cement bricks, because my favorite material for the job, styrofoam, would be quite fragile if it came into direct contact with epoxy resin. This is why being creative and adding lots of cool ideas into the diorama pays off big time, but I take no credit here, I just copied what was in the original artwork. The same went for small clay bricks. I would normally make them from styrofoam, or even better, 3D print them, but because I have a bag of plaster bricks, there were a much quicker option. To ensure everything will stay in place and won't soak up paints or epoxy resin, I flooded the whole area with alcohol and diluted PVA glue. When things were dry enough, I could start sculpting the less exciting terrain. Switching the tip of my handheld foam cutter for this needle-like shape allows me to add lots of irregular and delicate grooves into the foam, and despite my trypophobia, I also perforated the smooth sections as this will help with the adhesion of the mud paste. Air drying clay or paper mache are the most traditional terrain sculpting materials, but the smart mud from VMS is something of a high-tech upgrade. It's very soft, lightweight, easy to sculpt, and dries into a rock-hard finish. I partnered up with VMS a long time ago because I love their products and smart solutions. And because of that, I have a discount for you if you'd like to get some of these cool things as well. You can either shop through the VMS store if you're in Europe, or through Michigan Toy Soldier Company if you're in the US. Links and discount codes are in the video description. Next up is the road, and here I went with simple square 5x5mm cobblestones. I thought about maybe cutting off the original plaster road section and using it here because it would save me some time and most importantly, it wouldn't be affected by enamel paints. But ultimately, I decided to create it on my own because carving some cool things into a single piece of styrofoam is just too satisfying. You can add all kinds of subtle damage, cracks in the stones, even texture it with a jagged rock or a ball of crunched up aluminum foil, and remove some of them if you want to show the passage of time and deterioration. That's why I kept it separate for the time being, and now, with every important element glued in place, I can enclose the diorama with veneer, just as I did on the water mill. The band-aid on my finger is no joke, and I'd like to stress how important it is to be focused when you're working with sharp blades. The veneer on itself is very hard, and it takes a few blade passes to make a clean cut, and even then you have to put some serious pressure on the knife. So you can imagine, I was measuring and cutting, and because it's a rather boring job, I was somewhere else in my thoughts. All of a sudden, I noticed that the blade went through my fingertip and stopped by the nail bit. And although it didn't hurt at first, I knew it was deep and bad. 
the wound kept opening for three days. So it was the exact opposite of good times, as you can probably imagine. So, yeah, I know I don't talk about safety too much on this channel, but seriously, be safe at your workbench. Okay, we already saw how to fill the veneer with acrylic body, but when it comes to groundwork, the VMS mud paste is the greatest thing ever. But there can be situations when even more sophisticated tools are required, such as on these rocks for example. The best approach for me is to use two-part epoxy bodies such as Magic Sculpt, which does the filling job perfectly, but you can also shape it, make it smooth or coarse, Pretty much anything you need to do, this body can do it. Now we can add the fine, realistic ground texture. I've been using real earth from my garden, trademark, since the beginning, but recently I helped VMS develop their own ground textures. These are much more specific and they're gonna be great for certain types of terrain, such as the desert, gravel or city rubble. They're also much more durable and won't get all mushy once you soak them up with alcohol and diluted PVA glue, because they're actually made from various types of ground up rock and other stuff. For example, this one is made from real bricks, and it's mostly made up from very fine dust and tiny pebbles. I mean, real earth is still gonna be my main texturing workhorse, but whenever more specific textures are needed, these are gonna come in super handy. If you're thinking that we've just been building and gluing and texturing stuff for too long and it would be great if we finally started putting paint on something, then I probably have some good news for you. Because the only thing that's left to add before we move to my painting workbench is some basic foliage. In my book, that just means adding various lengths of static grass which can be painted along with the ground. More detailed vegetation, such as various paper plants, are easier to add later. I like to use two or three different lengths of synthetic grass, which I bought many, many years ago, and apply it with the aid of a static grass applicator. There are many high-end machines out there, but I'm still using a generic cheap one I picked up on eBay. It has a hard time with longer grass, so I like to plant it with tweezers, and what I tried to achieve here was a gradient of sorts, with the densest and tallest grass near the creek and less vegetation towards the road. Okay, my friends, so this is pretty much it. Everything that should be there is there, and everything else that isn't there will be there at the end of the video. So let's start with the water mill, shall we? I started with my usual routine, spraying the entire building with black primer. This gives me a good foundation for some quick artificial shadows which can be quickly established with an airbrush. But just as I'm recording this, I already have an idea for the exact opposite approach on my next project, and I think it might lead to some very interesting and definitely different results. But you know, we'll see. Let's focus on here and now. For brick walls, I have my standard color palette. And here's something we should be aware of. When you're painting bricks, stones, cinder blocks or something else, and you're using detailed reference images, you'll notice that the color variety is pretty much endless. It's very tempting to go all crazy because the sky's the limit, but I found that forcefully limiting yourself is a much better way because you can start going crazy from all the options out there. So limiting your color palette is actually better if you want to stay focused and get consistent results. Let's now take this Eastern European Barbie house and give it a more realistic weathered look. First of all, I added the mortar, using the same foam putty I used to fill the gaps in this building. I usually like to make these irregular and purposefully leave some gaps empty, but it can quickly make the wall look crumbly and decayed. Here I wanted to create an old building, sure, but one that's being kept in good working order. Once you get these two time-consuming steps out of the way, the rest is about stupid fun with acrylic washes. This is where you can let your creativity shine through and the workflow is rather simple and quick. Again, it's great when you can limit your color palette as this will streamline the entire process. I like to use light dusty tones first, then add some subtle moss and moisture with green paints, and finally add grime, fake shadows and all kinds of dirt with brown and black acrylics. 
There are many more effects to explore on brick walls, but this works pretty well as your basic weather surface. Of course, it's a good idea to vary the intensity depending on where the bricks are located. I kept the second floor cleaner than the first floor, and the pier for the water wheel has heavier signs of decay all over it. Let's now paint the cracked stucco with these acrylic paints. The basic approach is very similar to brick walls, because it's best to start with light and finish with dark tones. But there's a lot of room for experimentation and we also need to change or repeat a few steps here and there. The good thing is, there's not much precision work required, except when you're painting the cracks. This is again one of those cases when you can find so much variety in real life, and soon you can't even decide what effects you'd like to replicate. It also doesn't help me that I'm not painting these large buildings quite enough, and there are usually long gaps between them, so not only do I have to refresh my skills on each one, but many times I find myself sort of stepping in one place, experimenting and wondering what's gonna work best. I'll do a project where I can focus all my attention on these effects and try to replicate them as realistically as I can, while establishing some easy to do workflow that can be easily recreated. But the bottom line is that old stucco can be really nasty. My girlfriend says the mill looks like it came from a horror movie, and I'm just shaking my head thinking that's how old buildings look like, right? I don't know, what do you think? Anyway, let's paint the roof, starting with a warm, dark grey color as a quick base coat. Here I went for a slightly different approach and started establishing the basic textures and volumes with very rough dry brushing. I'm not concerned about the fineness of this effect, it's just to add some visual interest and rudimentary shadows. The remaining steps are all pretty time consuming and there's just no way around it, at least to my limited knowledge. <laughs> After finding good images of slate roofs, I noticed that there's some subtle color variation. So I grabbed various rusty, sandy, brown and other acrylics and applied them in a way of diluted filters on roughly half of the individual tiles. Depending on the complexity of the finish you want to achieve, this might actually be an okay-ish presentable result. But of course, texture can be always added in the form of speckling. This is pretty much the same ordeal all over again, the same paints, the same dilution, just applied as tiny droplets flicked off the paintbrush. This pattern is pretty cool, it kinda reminds me of dragon scales, right? Well, because they're made from thick paper, they kinda lack the volume and texture of tiles cut from rocks. So my only option was to compensate for these missing traits with some paint effects. Towards the bottom, I added a subtle highlight with light earth. It's a warm color that works great for highlights without adding that unnatural, cold feeling. This was pretty fast, but what took most of my time was adding the fake shadow. Here I used a mixture of raw umber and black, and I had to work in small sections because after application, I had to quickly go back and blend the paint. If the tiles were thicker and grittier, this effect most likely wouldn't be necessary, or a quick pin wash would do the job. Some tiles have a very strong, almost white surface, so I emphasized those with deck tan. Again, pure white would be very unnatural. And now it's time to add the icing on the slate tiled cake in the form of moss. Moss on roofs is an awesome detail and whenever I'm walking outside and there's an old roof of any type, it has a ton of the stuff growing all over it. Moss usually collects in these large fluffy clumps, they look like green pillows, and when the density increases, it can create an entire carpet on the roof. To achieve this randomness, I like to apply the PVA glue with a combination of brush painting and also speckling. Fine Turf from Woodland Scenics is a pretty nice representation because it has that subtle yet fluffy quality to it, and it comes in almost unlimited supply for our needs. I was never content with using scenic materials in their raw, unpainted form, because I like to shift the color palette to wherever I like it, but even more importantly, integrate these effects with the surrounding area. 
Fake moss is very easy to paint using the wet blending method because it acts as a sponge. Well, it actually is a ground up sponge, so there's that. And by wet blending, I mean applying diluted acrylic paints on top of each other without waiting for the previous layers to dry. But in a completely reverse fashion. I start with the darkest tones and finish with the lightest, applied in the smallest amount. The dark paints applied in generous amounts will blend it with everything else, while the vivid green tones will add a bit of punch to the effect. So that's the roof finished right there, and I'm not sure if it's adding or subtracting from that horror appearance. I mean, it's not like I'm gonna repaint it now in a romantic Christmas comedy tones, so let's continue, I guess. For the stonework at the bottom, I once again chose a very limited palette, and most of it was warm earth colors. I again started with the quick dry brush of grey over black, just to bring out the texture and contours of each stone. I added a few bricks here and there, pretty much every stone that had a rectangular shape was painted like a brick, and the rest was painted with those brownish and sandy colors. Here I wasn't quite sure how to proceed, and large areas of stonework might be another area where I should get more practice, because ultimately I went with a very similar approach to the one I used on the bricks. Once again, there's so much variation in real life that you can simply have to pin down one specific look and try to replicate that, otherwise you'll just lose your mind. Also, if there's one specific feature where the initial construction, or in this case sculpting, is absolutely crucial, then stones are definitely it. You'll see how much easier it'll be when I'm painting those real stones in the creek. So yeah, I pretty much weathered them the same way as I did with the bricks, and as a finishing touch, I added a subtle highlight towards the upper edge of each stone. This is the result, and I'm not saying I'm 100% satisfied with it because my original idea was something quite different, but at least it fits into the overall picture. The wooden beams were an absolute pleasure to paint because their texture was totally on point. By the way, I almost completely forgot to mention how plaster is a much better material to paint than styrofoam. When you prime it, the surface has almost no absorption and it's easier to create some of those crispier details in your paint job. Styrofoam mostly absorbs paint and the results are always quite blurry. This leads me to think of some alternatives. I don't really want to switch from styrofoam to something else because I'm already so familiar with this material, but I'll try a few tricks on how to seal and smooth out the surface so it'll be possible to add more delicate details and make it easier to paint. At this point I kept hearing that the building still looked spooky AF, so I decided to give it a splash of vivid color. Windows, shutters, doors and the railing on the patio were all pretty obvious surfaces that are usually painted in real life. I chose a pale blue color that would not only contrast pretty nicely with the faded wood underneath, but also with the overall color palette of the diorama, which will mainly consist of earth tones, various shades of green and some grey. I was hesitant to use chipping fluid for the worn paint because wood might absorb most of the stuff, but wood created from plastic sheets would definitely work with that method. Also, when I looked at reference images, all the rusty details are often surprisingly boring. Just a very dark, matte surface with some subtle hints of rust. Of course, it depends on the type of metal and everything, but it was an interesting observation and it offsets the dramatic effects happening pretty much everywhere else. Now, the water wheel and the floodgate were something else. Completely different type of surface, not to mention the shape of these things. Well, the floodgate is mostly just rusty metal, so I painted it the same way as the door hinges. But the water wheel was a small project on its own. I had no authentic wood grain texture to work with except for the 3D printed parts and the inner areas were pretty hard to reach. Luckily I tried dry brushing instead of my traditional drawing of the individual wood grains with a pointy paintbrush and it worked like a charm. 
Not only was I able to create some sufficient fake wood grain, but it was very easy to replicate the same effect on the inside of the wheel, where it would be otherwise difficult to work with much accuracy, if any at all. It was also a huge relief, because I knew the wheel would be quite dark in the end. After all, that's how they look in reference images, most likely due to the constant soaking in water and everything. At this point, I was so relieved that one of the most terrifying tasks on this project had actually become very manageable. Sure, all the metal parts took some time and patience to paint in the same way as the previous ones, but at that point it was more satisfying than troublesome. So that's the finished water wheel right here, and if we put all these elements into context, we're starting to get the overall picture. Sure, it looks very out of place on the unpainted base, so let's jump right into that. The groundwork contains a lot of very different materials and colors, so there's just no way around it. A generous coat of primer will make painting easier, and the overall tone of the scenery will match that of the water mill. Luckily, a lot of the heavy lifting can be done with an airbrush. Starting with the grass, because this process creates a ton of overspray. In fact, I think there's usually more overspray than spray spray. <laughs> you know what I mean? I've been told that my grass tends to look kinda dark. And a part of the problem might be that I'm using a relatively dark base color, deep green. So this time I really pushed it with all kinds of paints I had laying around, trying to make it more cheerful, but also to emphasize that gradient I mentioned while we were planting the grass. Basically, I wanted to have all the vivid green tones around the creek and the water mill, because that's where all the moisture is at, and dustier, dry tones towards the road. Then I could start painting the earth tones, starting with a very dark one in the creek, but I also used it to fix all the overspray. It's the usual post-shading approach, starting with darks and finishing with lights. This way we can highlight those clumps of earth and rocks, but of course more effects will be added later. I also sprayed the road, as I'm going to pick out the individual stones with dry brushing. Ok, that's a pretty decent base coat, and in fact the grass is already finished at this stage. Now we can start with brush painting. I decided to begin with the creek, because this is undoubtedly the busiest, most interesting part of the scenery. And also because every painting method used here will be just a recap of what we did on the water mill. See how easy it is to paint real stones using the wet blending method? It's incredible how a rather sloppy method results in nice results when the shape and texture are on point. The same goes for the concrete piers under the floodgate. Just a greyish base from graphite, followed by wet blending using light earth, deck tan on the very top, and raw umber at the bottom. Sure, it took me some time to paint everything here, but seriously, the methods were the same, and it was much easier than the building. Let's now quickly treat the road in a similar fashion. As I said, dry brushing was the MVP here, because it allowed me to efficiently pick out the individual stones while leaving the gaps between them painted with earth colors. I was wondering how I would visually integrate the Chevy truck with the ground, and after looking at a few references, I realized that cobblestones can be very dark. So I used the same rubber black color as I did on the truck's wheels, and voila, visual connection. Overall, I used much darker tones than in my Normandy 1944 diorama, but it's just another case of so much variety that happens all around us in real life. I didn't want to risk any damage caused by enamel thinners, so I weathered the entire section with acrylics. But as I said, styrofoam is like a sponge, so most of the effect was getting absorbed, so I went over it a little bit with an airbrush as well. All the main elements are now painted, at the very least, in their base colors, and before advancing any further, it felt right to glue the water mill in place, because I knew it would need some further painting if I wanted to integrate it nicely into the diorama. This also meant filling the small gap in the veneer, and is the same reason I didn't varnish the sides until this point. 
I used acrylic wood putty with an oak color, and although it was still quite visible after sanding, the wood stain made it almost completely non-existent. I mean, yeah, you can still see it clearly if you look for it, but I think the result is pretty subtle. Also, I think next time I'll use a sponge to apply the wood stain, because these large stiff brushes leave a few brush marks and they don't look very good. But with the veneer finished, the whole diorama slowly starts to click together. Everything just looks finished, but we're not there. Not even close. Well, technically speaking, all the integration into the groundwork, so to say, was done by adding more mossy effects on the rocks. That's the power of using the same consistent color palette throughout your entire project. By the way, anytime I'm working with a paintbrush, I'm using those fantastic third generation acrylics from AK Interactive. I partnered up with them this year because they have high quality products and good ideas. And I like them as a company. So, if you like their stuff as well, you can use my affiliate link in the video description, as well as a discount code. And not only you'll pay less for your order, but you'll help me out with your purchase. The only case where I used enamels was the groundwork, and that's just because they're much easier to work with over such a greedy surface. The basic tone applied with an airbrush was fairly close to what I had in mind, so I used them just to add some more tonal variety and contrast. I also wanted to try making a creeper plant, and this was as good a time as any. After all, it physically ties the building to the ground, right? So I made the base of it from dried up roots which I've super glued to the walls, and the leaves were made from catkin seeds. If you have birch trees near you, go pick a bunch of their fallen seeds and break them apart. Tons of cool, although kinda generic looking miniature leaves will pop out. Oh yeah, this is the only other part where I used enamels. Specifically a dark wash because it spreads much quicker than acrylics. Just an easy way to achieve a good dark undercoat. Then I could easily paint them with my two favorite colors whenever it's time to paint something green and vivid. It wasn't much work at all, and I was pleasantly surprised with the results. The diorama is now ready for some epoxy resin in the creek, but first, let's take a break and paint the inhabitants of this scene. Initially, I had much more ambitious plans with five figures, three of them made from plastic, but... I don't know, call me spoiled because I've been only painting resin figures, but I just couldn't build them into something that I would consider a satisfying figure. So in the end, I decided to use only this amazing set from Dynamo models. These figures are 3D sculpted just like the ones from Panzer Art, and the details are absolutely out of this world. I have a detailed video about my painting method, and I mentioned there how good figures paint themselves, and it's totally true. It's a pleasure when you have lots of well-defined, crisp details that are just asking you to highlight and outline them. However, the more surface details a figure has, the longer it will take you to paint all of them properly. Just two figures, but they took me three days to finish. The simple story of this diorama will be a US soldier paying the Miller's son for the sacks of flour. I know, nothing groundbreaking, but I knew from the beginning that this diorama will be mainly about the huge water mill, not the story. Okay, let's take a small break here. There are two things about figures that I just have to mention. As I said, at first I was very ambitious with the amount of figures and the story told by them. One of my initial plans was to use a service called Aladdin Models, and it's a site full of 3D models, and they also have figures, but not just any. You can actually pose them. So the way it works is that they have this catalog of historically accurate figures in various uniforms and you have various animated poses and you can stop the animation at any point and save that as a 3D file. Now the only reason I didn't use it was because I have a pretty low-end 3D printer which works just enough for my own purposes but when it comes to organic shapes or figures it just wouldn't cut it so I went the easier route but it's definitely worth checking out if you can use this technology to its fullest potential. 
and I'll leave you a link down in the video description. And the second figure related thing I would like to bring into your attention is this cool book. I already mentioned it in my community tab before it was released and okay I know it's about German figures but there's a lot of useful information in there. I'd say it's one of those rarer books where you have very detailed step-by-step -step instructions for painting not just uniforms but also skin tones and what really caught my attention was all the details such as boots, shovels, you know, belts and so on. So that's really cool. And what's a really nice touch is that it's not just about figures but also reference images. You have reenactors posing in the same pose as the figure and that's just totally awesome. And just like with everything else in this video, I'm leaving you a link down below. Okay, before we add the finishing touches, let's deal with the epoxy water. After my two previous attempts, I was a bit hesitant to say the least and quite frankly messing up the biggest diorama I've ever done at the very end with a failed resin pour wasn't very high on my list of priorities this year. Well, let's take it one step at a time. Taping was easy with just two small openings in the veneer. Insulation was also simple, just a thick coat of steel water spread evenly with a paintbrush because the porous surface underneath would lead to some serious resin leakage and lots of air bubbles. I left it to dry for about half a day and then it was time to mix the resin. In my previous water vignette I made a mistake by not mixing the resin thoroughly and a large portion of it still remains tacky and soft to this day. Not cool at all, so instead of using a metal needle I used a piece of balsa wood and I stirred the resin for at least 5 uninterrupted minutes. I was completely and totally focused on not messing this up. I also forsaken any exotic colors such as flat earth for tinting and went with my tried and tested khaki wrap which gives you this amazing very natural looking murky water. Oh right I almost forgot the total volume of resin was 60 milliliters 40 milliliters of resin 20 of hardener. I thought it was gonna be too much and a lot of this good stuff would end up in the trash can but surprise I used it all. And it still wasn't quite enough. You see the paddles are submerged, more or less, but I wanted the water level to reach the rim of the wheel as well. However it was due to my design of the creek. I made the banks a bit too shallow, especially with the cinder blocks and the bricks, so adding any more would mean spilling water out of the creek bed and that wouldn't be very cash money. So after removing the air bubbles with a butane torch, I had to find something large enough to cover the entire scene and I left it to dry peacefully overnight. I entered the studio with bated breath, but it is with great pleasure to inform you that a rock hard resin was awaiting me. No spillage, no air bubbles. What a day, right? So let's get it done. Slice off the raised edges with a blade and quickly cover them up with still water. And while I'm at it, add some on the sides that were affected by the adhesive from the tape. The ripples were made from transparent water gel, but these were some tight working conditions, especially under the floodgate and the water wheel. I didn't like what I was seeing, so I cheated a little and adjusted their shape with bursts of air from my airbrush. I didn't want to do much except some subtle foam where the water hits rocks because references showed me that there's very little to no splashing if the wheel is powered from below. It's a different story when water falls on the wheel from above of course. And now I could attach the patio with stairs, which is where the story is gonna take place. All the important elements are now in place and the diorama could be finished. But I still wanted to add a handful of those small finishing touches. Paper vegetation is much easier to add at the very end because it's easier to evaluate which areas need some extra detail. They come from model scene, AK and green stuff world and I painted them all with a very dark color beforehand. This allows me once again to add those vivid tones in a post shading manner making them look more three-dimensional. 
The final detail, which I didn't film, was the addition of gutters and downspouts. I wasn't sure if I wanted to add those because 7 out of 9 water mills don't have them, but it just felt right. After all, you wouldn't like rain gushing down on your patio. And finally, before we end this video, I have a sort of small general advice. A diorama like this or any huge project can seem very intimidating and when you start thinking about it you'll feel like how am I ever gonna finish this or how am I gonna solve this and I definitely felt this way when I was working on this one. So what I like to employ in these situations is a so-called infinity principle and basically whatever the problem is no matter how complex it might seem, you can break it down into countless, infinite, smaller problems, which are much easier to solve. Then you solve them one by one, which is a piece of cake, and you put them all together, and suddenly a huge problem is solved. It's not some groundbreaking or innovative modeling technique, but it's just a small useful mental trick to help you solve these large issues. Now I just had to position and super glue the figures and the vehicle in place. This is the first diorama where my figures aren't connected with a metal pin to the ground, because, well, they're not on the ground. And the car, well, let's just hope super glue will be enough to hold it in place, like, forever. <laughs> And there we go, my friends. My largest and most complex diorama ever is finished. And ironically, it's not my 100% scratch built creation, but a commercial kit. But that doesn't mean it wasn't a huge amount of work. So far, I believe my most complex diorama was cats and dogs, but that one is noticeably smaller than this one. And it's not just the size though, but all the elements that create the scene. Water, rocks, road, grass, water wheel, floodgate, figures, you know how it goes. Well, it just goes to show you that if you want to make dioramas that are not just a simple earth colored pancake, you don't have to invest in all those specialized tools and make every component from scratch. There are high quality kits out there that you just need to assemble and have fun with painting and aging effects. On a different note, this video took very long to finish. I wanted to keep the whole diorama concept a secret for that final reveal, but quickly realized that there's taking your time with something, and then there's something taking forever to finish. So the next time I'm tackling something this huge, I'll break it down into more episodes. As for the next project, I'm already shaking all over my body because I wasn't this stoked in a long time. It's not gonna be a military vehicle, definitely not an airplane, but something completely different to what we normally do here, yet at the same time quite familiar. You'll see, it's gonna be tons of fun. In the meantime, I want to sincerely thank every single one of you for watching these videos, because if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be sitting here building models for a living, and I can't thank you enough for this amazing opportunity. All of this is also possible thanks to my incredible patrons. My whole Patreon page is like a Night Shift magazine subscription, as I post there pretty often when the opportunity arises, and you'll get updates from my workbench, we can get in touch through DMs, comments and emails, I'm posting one week early ad free videos and those stay there forever, so you can always get back to them without even keeping track of these official uploads on my channel. I also have some extra goodies such as 3D models which you can download and print for your own projects a bunch of real-life references for nature, old buildings and so on, and last but not least, these high-resolution studio photos which show the model in more detail than video ever could. It would help me a lot, but you know, no pressure. Anyway, my friends, as I said, the next one is gonna be something very different, yet still familiar. I also said something about getting more practice and refining my skills when it comes to miniature buildings, so that should give you some ideas. Anyway, I'm gonna sprint to my studio and start working on it, okay? I'll try to release it before or during the holidays, because I think it's gonna be a pretty manageable project. 
and you you just stay safe stay awesome build your models don't just collect them and i'll see you in the next one cheers